We're here to increase our collective understanding of how great cities are shaped. We believe everyone has a role to play in urban design. This is a space where we can learn from international examples and discuss issues relating to built form, the distinctiveness of cities and how we feel connected to place. We can be curious and open-minded. We can all learn and grow. So, let's get to it, Geelong. Today's topic is what the character, or why the character of cities matters. And to address this important topic, we've got two experts speaking about heritage and landform, topography, amongst um, other um, issues as well. Our first speaker um, is Lee Woolley. Uh, Lee is a Tasmanian architect with over 35 years professional experience in architecture and urban design, both um, in Australia and internationally. He is the recipient of numerous professional design awards um, across these disciplines at both state and national level. And he's authored several critically acclaimed studies considering the landscape of the city and the role of settlement in revealing place. He's also a Churchill um, Fellow and an adjunct professor in architecture and design at University of Tasmania and practices um, from Hobart. So over to Lee. Thank you. Um, are we now seeing my screen? <laughs> Is that the first image up? Uh, am I right? Um, Not yet, Lee. Sorry. Um, can you uh, share? I'm sharing the screen. Is that, Is that there? No. Are we right? Sorry We're about good that. Good to go. <laughs> okay, thanks, Jonathan. Well, th thank you, and um, and uh, and further to that lovely welcome to country. I, I suggest that all cities are experienced as landscapes. Indeed, our relationship with place is articulated in and through landscape. So, in response to a city's location. I suggest that it's the characteristics of their landform that underpin and then reveal their identity, form and character. Now that can be as diverse as the origins of Paris within the islands of the Seine uh, in the background image there, or indeed the containment of Beijing by its Western Hills, um, even difficult to ascertain in the image in the, your bottom right there, which I took in 1974 um, or indeed there's um, uh, the role of the now largely obscured but um, fundamental to the origins and form of Tokyo are its rivers and waterways. And, and there are contemporary examples such as the um, re-engaged role of the Qianjiong stream in central Seoul in the middle image there. Now these are all examples of the movement and flow of water. Um, arguably the greatest natural agent of change, but it's more so in the, these have helped define and influence the layout and form uh, of each of these cities. But they're also examples of how the underlying geology and if you like the geomorphologies are influencing the subsequent layers, the urban morphologies. And this layering, I suggest, is not only fundamental to their urban character, but it also reinforces for their residents of knowing where they are. So the way in which cities are experienced, where they are placed, not just how they are made, demands consideration. So in this sense, location matters. And in the geographic south, and more specifically Southeast Australia, but particularly Tasmania, it's the oceanic context and the influence of the cold currents of the Southern Ocean that dramatically inform living outcomes. This is in contrast to the warm currents of the Indian and Pacific Oceans um, that largely inform the rest of the landmass of Australia. So in this sense, I suggest this very much contributes to our regional distinctiveness. 
<clears throat> now in Tasmania, it's not that Tasmania is so mountainous, but there's limited low ground. And the image in the corner there is, a, if you like, a brain scan or a section through Tasmania at 200 metres elevation. And what the, the darkened area shows is that there's very little low ground in, uh, in Tasmania. And so what this means is that people live in locations where views are anticipated. They are commonplace. And what it also means is that landform rather than built form provides orientation in this dwelling region. And this is, exam this is experienced daily um, from the uh, on ground in the central city streets, such as this image uh, in, from central Hobart, viewing across the water plain of the harbour to the high ground of the Tasman Peninsula, some nearly 50 kilometres away. And what that means is that the sense of scale and proportion, I suggest, is provided by our landforms, more so in this instance than our built forms. And what that then means is that our landform horizons bound our urban identity. In this instance, in contrast also with our water plains. And topography intervenes or insinuates itself often against our will, but it's nonetheless there, it's a constant. And it's a constant then when you, one strives to understand the dwelling region. And in essence, in southeastern Tasmania, it's a contrast between rising and high ground, and this is a satellite image of southeast Tasmania with central Hobart in the middle. It's a contrast between that rising and high ground as a containment and then a release across the water plane of the harbour and the ocean beyond. And if we then move to considering that specifically in terms of central Hobart and then looking at some guidelines that can try to deal with that in terms of how we develop the city centre and its density, I suggest it's a matter of trying to understand each city and in this instance Hobart as a city with an intelligible topography. And that means understanding those landforms simplistically, quite simply as a diagram. And I bring your attention to the central basin there in the middle of the diagram where the landform of central Hobart and the beginning of the urban blocks are indicated. And I'll come back to that because that then becomes the focus of density within the region. And of course, the greater region like Greater Geelong has a similar population, interestingly enough, Greater Hobart. But of course, what unfortunately has happened here is that we've ended up with travel distances within the five municipalities equivalent to the travel distances in, in, in uh, metropolitan Melbourne in terms of their, um, the, the extent to which people are expected to travel. And that, of course, doesn't necessarily understand, particularly Hobart, as essentially a small city in a large landscape. And that then means trying to understand and bring terminologies to bear that actually understand that as an urban amphitheater within the drowned valley of the Derwent and then the harbour connection. And that then means if we're going to look at a consolidation, which is the intent, then it's a matter of understanding that centre within that basin and looking at some existing buildings that are perhaps non-conforming in terms of that consolidation. And that means then considering a layered urban form. And I'll quickly take you through some layers of height controls that have sought to then step back from the waterfront, from the harbour, step in from the cove towards a definition of that centre, stepping in from the inner hills and then defining a central core. And within that central core, it's then, we're then able to consider if this is where density is to be consolidated, what are the heights that may be appropriate to buildings in that core? And that then gives rise to the amenities that we take for granted often, which includes view lines and view connections to the landform horizons that actually define our sense of the heart of settlement. 
And I won't go through all these, but there are 60 of these which actually then contribute to understanding the location of major landforms and how you view from them, both through the city, but to the landform and water plane horizons. And there are many of these, including from at, at water level, but also from major public spaces within Hobart, the connections from within looking out to those horizons, and also the connections coming into the city centre from the rising ground beyond. These all then contribute to understanding how there may be an overlaying of those views and view lines that may inform the density and height of those central blocks. And that then means looking at those central urban blocks in their own right, individually, in terms of their topography, the proportions of them, there's a history to why the proportions are different, the existing built form, the nature of the lots that have existed, and, and then the amenity building envelope that has started to be applied to consider light into those central city streets. But where the, where the work I'm showing you extends this is to then look at extending those amenity building envelopes up to the underside of the view cones, which are overlaid in this instance in terms of a range of sections, to then start to consider the potential, notwithstanding a range of other heritage and townscape principles, but to consider a, an additional scale beyond what the existing planning scheme has allowed. And this then, when that is melded together, and I'm going very quickly, that then brings together a possibility of an additional envelope scale to, the, to those blocks, but based on the amenity of getting views out of keeping light within the streets. And when that's all amalgamated together, you can then look at the, um, uh, the potential of um, a layering of those height controls in terms of the setting of the landform of the city. And you can then gesture to going back to each of those viewpoints to what the potential form of an envelope might be in terms of uh, increasing uh, building uh, density, but maintaining the amenity of those connections within the landform and within the landform horizons of the setting. So that was a very, a very quick overview. But in summary, I suggest to strengthen awareness of the character of the cities in which we live, we should take the opportunity to acknowledge the fundamental symbolic and ecological significance of our regional landforms and their particularities from the centre of settlement. And in this way, I suggest the enduring civic role of a shared landscape can be maintained, while the character of the city itself enhanced. And perhaps through this way, progressively, our cities can then be more readily understood or appreciated as sheltering places in larger landscapes. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Um, the, the, the relationship between land form and built form um, is obviously um, very clear in your presentation and, um, and, and obviously very important. But um, what about cities that, that don't have a strong topography? Yeah, of course. Well, what I'd suggest is that <clears throat> all cities have a topography and, and it's important because that's the mechanism by which we get into an understanding of the location as a layered place. And each city needs to identify and work with its own horizons um, within the natural world. Some of those may be landform horizons, some may be water plane horizons, some indeed may be built horizons. Nonetheless, they contribute to our sense of the location within the world and the importance of the city not being the end of the world, not being the only thing within the world, but it's the location from which we ought to be the most settled. And in consequence, those connections to what is beyond become not only important, but it also links us, I suggest, to the natural world. And that's mm. the simplest 
kind of <laughs> pricey, I suppose. Thank you, Lee. Um, obviously, you're covering a lot of um, of information, so I'm sure there'll be a lot of um, good questions um, in the discussion afterwards. Um, but we move on now to um, our second speaker, um, Dr. David Rowe. Um, David is the Director of um, Authentic Heritage Services. He's also the Heritage Advisor to the City of Greater Geelong, and as well as uh, the Golden Plains and Surf Coast Shires. He's the author of numerous heritage studies, conservation management plans, and heritage analysis um, to inform urban design frameworks. And he's also just finished writing about Corio, the a thematic history of Greater Geelong, um, which will be published uh, later this year. Um, David is passionate about heritage conservation and working collaboratively to achieve respectful and viable heritage solutions. David, over to you. Many thanks, Jonathan. So why the character of cities matters for following on from, from Lee's uh, excellent presentation. Um, the character of cities is an important tangible expression of community identity and heritage is a community's inheritance of values, traditions, culture and character passed down by previous generations. Urban heritage character includes the layers, and, and Lee's talked about layers, layers of historical and physical evidence defined by the local environment, the town plan, the architecture, the infrastructure, and the landscapes. So starting with the local environment or following on from what Lee um, has been talking about, the topography and the natural settings governed where cities were located and how they were developed. Geelong, the country of the Wadarong, was selected in 1837 because it was the portion of land where Corio Bay and the Bowen River were close together. The bay offered potential as a port and the river provided a water supply. And Corio Bay and environments, environs continue to characterise Geelong today. And just like Lee was discussing before, the, the water plain of Corio Bay, magnificent views from the foreshore over to, to um, beyond to the Yuyangs, and you can see that um, very much so from the principal streets of central Geelong. The urban layout, another really important part that uh, defines our the historic characteristics of our cities today. And it's overlaid on the natural topography. The rectangular grid for Geelong, which was laid out in 1838, like that in Melbourne, which was laid out a year earlier, gave uniformity in the layout of streets and allotments for subdivision. Both plans were directed by Robert Hoddle, the government surveyor, and the large widths of the streets, whilst they're functional, both in Melbourne and Geelong, um, also provided good ventilation, which uh, was really important at the time because the surveying of these cities was also influenced by obsolete miasmatic theory, where bad air was thought to create disease. Uh, so whilst the streets today um, are great for traffic, um, that wasn't the original reason obviously for them. So the original hodl grid as we call it um, on the left uh, is shown in the red shaded area, the northern portion of that red shaded area being Lonsdale Street, the southern portion Flinders Street um, near the Yarra River. On the right of course is Geelong, the original portion of the grid from Jeringhap Street to the west to um, Swanson Street to the east, the Cryo Bay to the north and the Bowen River to the south. Melbourne's grid of course is well built up, Melbourne being the capital of Victoria and it's very well urbanised. Geelong's um, did not get as well urbanised originally and this distinguishes it and its particular character, its, its identity, its urban identity. And again, the, the natural environment has played a big role here. The sandbar at the entrance to Corio Bay um, to the east of Geelong prevented large ships from entering and that thwarted Geelong's progress originally. This influenced the development and the scale of Geelong for many years. In 1838, as you can see in the image, early plan of Geelong in 1838, the town was actually divided into two. It was known as two townships. There was North Geelong, not the North Geelong, the suburb as we know it today, but North Geelong 
beside Corio Bay, uh, where the port uh, development occurred, some commercial development and residential development. Whilst to the south, to the left in this case, near the Bowen River, was residential development, some industrial development, flour mills, etc., and some cultural development. And in between, the land was then undeveloped and linked only, or was to be linked only by one street. And that really still forms part of the character of central Geelong and, and the hodl grid of Geelong today. We have central Geelong as we know it, the urban area, and more residential and mixed areas to the south near the Bowen River. Architecture is another key aspect of, our, of the character and identity that defines each particular city. The buildings themselves are signposts of different periods of progress, reflecting cultural attitudes, fashions, construction, and technology at different times. And of course, each city has its landmarks, these anchor points um, in our, in our uh, roofscapes, which we all can see from different vantage points. In Geelong, uh, St Mary's Basilica, the Catholic Basilica in Yarra Street, which commenced in 1854, completed in the 1930s, is one of uh, the key landmarks to the city that you have views of this building from various vantage points within and outside the city. It clearly reflects the importance of the church too in the 19th century and the cultural attitudes towards that and the dominance that the church played in society at the time. Architecture also shows us the stylistic evolution, the evolution of us as people and of design. And one, one example only here is how Geelong's, uh, the architects, Tombs and Durham, eminent architects, local architects, use the, um, uh, uh, the uh, Queen Anne revival, which had began in England in the 1870s, many years earlier, and made it their own. And this is what local architects in different cities did. They used the fashions of the day to suit the local circumstance. And here, uh, uh, as I said, we have this Queen Anne revival uh, design in the 1890s, early 1890s, under construction on the left with its picturesque Dutch gables and its candle snuffer tower at the corner, which is really distinctive in Geelong and drawing on a particular fashion. We also have standardised designs in our cities, and this is really important too. We have this landmark building in Geelong, the TNG, corner of Moorable and, and Rara Streets, built in the 1930s, uh, very strong geometry, rendered a, a, a finish, uh, and also an Art Deco clock tower, which of, of course is a hallmark of its land, landmark um, character. Of course, though, the TNG used this particular prototype, this standardised design throughout several cities in Victoria and interstate. And what, what we see here is that the corporate identity of the Temperance and General Society linked the urban character of several cities. So it, it provided a, a connection between cities and, and governments did the same thing. They provided um, an understanding or uniformity to the designs of courthouses and post offices, for example, and therefore this understanding and uniformity of presence of, of government. And architecture also in our urban environment is characterised by technology and construction. One example here, the state government offices in Little Mallop Street, built in the 1970s with its really unusual inverted, inverted pyramid form, celebrates uh, precast concrete construction and the technology of the day. And of course, our cities are also defined by precincts or neighbourhoods. Uh, in Geelong, that is especially the case with the Woolstores area, the Woolstores precinct um, to the northwest of the of the CBD on the waterfront. Geelong became the wool capital of Victoria. This is where the graziers brought their, their wool to, to store and to sell. And so we have these amazing three to four storey utilitarian masonry buildings constructed between the 1840s and the 1960s. And most of them are still there today and have been reused. So this was really what um, set off the Geelong economy for all of those years. And so what I'm showing you here on the left is an aerial, largely in the foreground now is the waterfront campus of Deakin Uni. Over to the top left is uh, the Shannon Murray wool store, now the facades of the Westfield uh, shopping centre. And then centre to that is the, the wool museum in, in um, Moorable Street. To the right uh, is a view 
of the 1930s of the Dalgetty and Company wool stores, now the, the waterfront campus of Deakin, um, shown from the pier, Cunningham Pier. Infrastructure is also another uh, key defining element of character. And that could well be just simple things of paving and, and the need for drainage, bluestone uh, paving and, and curbing, um, reflecting the technology of the day, of the 19th century, but also add texture to our cities. Bridges were not, in, not only became river crossings, but they became really important architectural and engineering landmarks in their own right and really um, provide distinction and an understanding of the progress of our cities. And certainly Princess Bridge in Melbourne, built during the marvellous Melbourne years of the 1880s, is testimony to that as shown on the right. And railway networks, our railways become really important transport hubs, places for meeting people. Uh, but the, the, the buildings themselves also became landmarks as we see here with the Edwardian Baroque uh, Flinders Street railway station. And of course, we have a whole different urban character beneath several cities with the, the railway subways themselves. In Geelong, of course, we have a railway uh, tunnel um, underneath um, between Rara Street and Kilgore Street, as you can see on the right, the Northern Portal. Our landscapes are really important, those that we've created um, as part of our cities. And public parks and gardens really are key elements of rec for recreation, the community interaction and aesthetic appeal. And one example here is uh, Johnston Park, uh, laid out in the 1840s, uh, transformed again in 1919, 1920. And it's become a really important civic and cultural hub in Geelong. The backdrop of classical buildings that you can see on the left there, the city hall, the art gallery, the Peace Memorial, and they have been reinforced with the Geelong Library and Heritage Centre, as you can see on the right. So these are the key characteristics or some, just some of the key characteristics. And we try and manage that character and add extra layers because development can't be stopped and should not be stopped. But we just need to understand what is important about our cities so that what we do build has, is compatible and, and is part of an, under, an understood context. So where you've got higher additions to heritage buildings like the equity chambers in Melbourne, Retaining the three-dimensional integrity of the heritage asset is important. Stepping back the new work, the new work drawing on the rhythm of the old in a really um, contemporary and innovative way. And the overall scale being compatible with the scale of the precinct it's located within. Where we have infill development, uh, new work at, at street level, sometimes, it, it, and, and particularly where you have highly intact streets, its um, consideration might be that you look at the scale, you look at the form um, and the tone and the texture and the colour of the heritage asset without replicating them. We need to have buildings of today, not of yesterday, new buildings of today, I should say. So in this case, the former Bank of Montreal in Canada, the, the new work, this new addition has drawn on the cuboid uh, facade of the old, um, but, and the colour and the texture has too, but the actual that the actual appearance of it is very different. Um, the, the other thing I'd like to say in, in, in completing my, my presentation is the need for um, architectural regeneration and adaptive reuse. We have several buildings in central Geelong that have been covered through hoardings or paintwork. Those buildings are still there. And one example where this has been successfully achieved is the, is the Geelong Theatre. Um, you can see the building soon after it was completed in 1913 on the left. It had been covered in hoardings in the 20th century and those hoardings were relatively easily removed um, in the later 20th century, again, returning the building to its original character and enhancing this part of the street. Adaptive reuse, as I said, is really important for the sustainability and viability of our cities and our heritage building stock. Here we have the waterfront campus um, in its um, partly altered state, but the, 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 um, the character of those, the, the industrial character of those buildings has been retained. And lastly, reconstruction. Here we have an 1850s hotel building in, in Geelong, a significant building. The appearance of this building has been greatly enhanced by the simple removal of introduced overpainting, but also the reconstruction of the, the shop 
uh, windows, the ground floor windows, uh, and some repainting very simply have enhanced its character and the identity of Geelong. That brings an end to my presentation. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you very much, David. Um, I'm, I'm reminded with both talks of um, William Faulkner's quote, um, the past is never dead, it's not even past, and, and how history, um, w whether it's um, in land form or, or built form, um, keeps shaping uh, the cities that we lived in and should keep shaping the cities that we lived in. Um, while um, our audience um, are kind of collecting their thoughts and coming up with some questions for you. Um, I might just um, ask David um, if he could share with us um, maybe an insight about Geelong's heritage that perhaps uh, most of us are, are not aware of. Right, yes. Well, uh, um, as I mentioned, Geelong was laid out as two cities, uh, two separate entities, and originally Ballerine Street was to become the, the, linking, the linking city. That actually was Yarra Street, and there are glimpses of that understanding in the very early churches from the 1840s, church buildings in, in, um, it, that do just link north and south Geelong. And then Moorable Street was the second main uh, street, which has become the focus. I think the other thing that might not be un, uh, well known is the names of these streets. They might seem unusual, but these are all um, these main streets: Moorable, Mallop, Corio, Yarra, Jerringham, Ballerine, are all derived from from Waterong names, and that had been decreed one of the very few concessions by the. Uh, the governor of New South Wales in the 1830s, that these principal streets be named after the um, names of the traditional owners, as was the name of the, of the city or the town of Geelong. Thanks, David. Um, I, I wasn't aware of that um, fact, but now that you, you pointed out, um, and I guess there's probably a lot more insights you could reveal as well. Um, I think now we'll, we'll open it up to um, to our attendees today and to the audience um, for questions for Lee and David. But don't be shy. <laughs> We'd like to kick us off. If you have a question, if you can post it in the chat or in the Q&A. Got a question for Lee. Um, one of our um, attendees is asking Lee, what, what do you think of the skyline of Geelong? I would like to be able to answer that I'm more familiar with it than I am, but I think um, I think all cities have all cities have an identity, and and David's obviously. Uh, indicated that in strength. However, all cities, particularly um, those in Australia at the minute that are um, subject to increasing growth, and I think that's a positive thing for Geelong, means that the skylines we have may not continue, well, it's, it's how those skylines may remain as something that is um, changing, uh, because they've been changing from their from their early origins. But how do how might they continue to change as particularly city centres develop, whilst maintaining a sense of identity? And as I've indicated for Hobart, some of that is to do with uh, being able to shape that additional density to ensure that you get view line connections that still allow you to understand this, where you are from within the center of the city in terms of the region. And I think that as a principle is one that could be interesting to apply to Geelong. Mm. Thanks Lee. Um, I might ask David to, to, to comment um, on the skyline issue as well, because um, obviously, um, Height is a particular challenge um, for, for heritage 
I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, uh, it's a very good question. Um, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, Geelong being a regional city, it's been governed by its topography. And so the scale of Geelong has been relatively low as a reg regional city. I say low overall, but we have um, an, an evolution, as I also mentioned. So we've had some major monolithic structures, if you think of the wool stores, very large at the time of the 18, late 19th century, early 20th centuries. Um, how, we, how we need to address that is, um, I suppose, looking at the integrity uh, of our different precincts within the central uh, Geelong area. I certainly don't believe, that, like Lee has actually indicated, these, we've had change. Change is, is really important. Change is important to our cities because it maintains their sustainability. It's about how far that change goes and how quickly that change comes. And understanding the find of the finer grain of the different parts of our cities, I think is important to determining what height matters where. Mm. So for some of that, just to finish off, for example, the, the Western Wedge area, um, which is um, a, a quite a diverse area in terms of it's not um, particularly, there's some heritage buildings there, very important. It was the gateway into the central city of Geelong. Um, but they haven't interrupted um, particular um, historic streetscapes in any um, substantial way. Mm. Thanks, David. Um, we've had a couple of questions around the um, the issue of facadism. Um, so I might, um, David, I might start with you and then um, we'll get Lee's um, view on that as well. I mean, obviously this is related to um, adaptive reuse and some of the questions around, you know, um, how do we deal with this? How can we, um, how can we prevent um, tokenistic heritage preservation? Mm. Yeah, one of the major challenges I have in my role, um, and I think that one of, that's why I felt the example of, of the waterfront campus at Deakin was great because it's not just facades that have been retained, it's the internal uh, fabric, the floors, the ceilings, everything in it uh, has been modified but retained. How we, how we manage that, it's a conversation that needs to continue to be had more broadly than Geelong. Um, I, in my role, uh, try and advise against that. I, that buildings are three-dimensional entities and maintaining an understanding of that, of, of them as three-dimensional entities is really important. Sometimes um, economics and other planning matters, whatever it might be, get in the way of retaining more than just a wall. I would like to think that our urban environment is more than just a stage set for, for the next movie, that it means more to people than just that. So I don't have the answer to that. I think um, the city of Melbourne um, have undergone a similar experience of trying to address this issue and have uh, recently um, prepared some fantastic guidelines on, on simple, simple ways that we can be looking at to achieve that. And getting information out there is really important to trying to um, give a better understanding to everybody involved. Thanks, David. Um, Lee, do you have any thoughts on? Yeah, um, just just in terms of if we think of not only a, a building's three dimensional entities, but cities are indeed three and arguably four dimensional entities. Um, but in that, I'm not just uh, I'm suggesting that in fact we ought also think of the layered not only the layered history, but <laughs> the way in which, as I was saying earlier on, the way in which water flows or water flowed across the land and where that has actually informed um, uh, whether it be creeks or streams or early links or, or early um, tracks and how these are all part of the layered intelligence and logic of the location of which the buildings come later um, so I think I think our um, I think to reinforce what David was saying um, about the importance of individual buildings being understood in their entirety, I think we we have a an opportunity to really consider the locatedness of our cities as well mm. in terms of their their place. Mm. Um, we've got a few questions. I'm, I'm... I'm trying to sort of pull questions together um, because the, the, there are some uh, 
a lot of overlaps and, and parallels. But um, there's a very good question about, uh, I guess, the nature of character, and um, and the her you know the, the heritage value of of the built environment, and in relationship to you know it, is it defined by a point in time? Or is it something that evolves over time? And at what point do you decide, um, or should we decide, that um, the character of a city is one thing and not another? Hope that makes sense. So, you know, do we is it fixed in a point in time, or is it something that um, is forever um, evolving? So maybe um, David. You can start. Mm, sure. Certainly, uh, cities are ever evolving. If if we were to go back and think we were going to fix Geelong with its two little townships linked by Ballerine Street, we wouldn't have much of a township at all. Um, we need to understand, I suppose, what makes our cities significant. I'm talking from a European heritage perspective, um, of course. And of course, Geelong's um, integrity and change and the evolution of change in Geelong is very different to another city. If you look at the city of Ballarat, for example, which has a highly intact uh, streetscapes that, that reflect its, its success due to, to, due to gold, um, very different. But that doesn't mean that Geelong's um, um, character needs to be um, completely reconsidered as a consequence of that. Perhaps it can be enhanced more um, where we've already had change. So from a heritage principle perspective, where you've had a notable change or some change, there's often greater opportunity for additional change without having without harming the the ultimate significance and integrity of that character. Thanks, David. Um, Lee. Mm. Yes. Um... It, to me, this indicates how important the role of uh, particularly the agencies that manage our cities and the role of um, um, uh, both uh, the heritage um, uh, units and the urban design units within, these, within our cities are really important because it behoves those of us who are professionals working in this area to articulate the nature of change and indeed the importance of scale and proportion within our settlements. And that might, um, and for me, that means uh, in, in terms of uh, my view of things, the sense of scale and proportion provided by nature is then interpreted historically through different periods of building. And if we lose the connections or to the originals, <laughs> that is the landforms and then the early patterns uh, and, and there's disjuncture, then that be can become a problem. So the really important thing in the management is the managing of the moments of change and the integrity of those. And that's where uh, obviously the work that um, really good cities are doing around Australia in terms of their character is really important. Mm. Um, a very good question, I think, um, for both of you. Um, who decides what is significant mm. in inner cities in terms of character and heritage? Who decides and who should decide? Very interesting question. It depends on uh, I suppose your definition of significance, certainly from a European heritage um, perspective, um, there are guidelines, there's the Australia Ecomos Borough Charter, and often stri strategic planning departments and urban design units in our councils, local government councils, will uh, engage with experts. And they, those experts will will look at the evidence, they'll look at the historic evidence, they'll look at the physical evidence, they'll compare that with similar places and then determine through the criteria that government have established whether they're significant or not. Within that whole process is um, a consultation, consultation with community because it's the community that drives also what is significant. 
um, certainly from my experience. So that's from the European heritage perspective. Certainly my view um, on, on our Indigenous heritage is our traditional owners um, are the ones that uh, govern what is significant and uh, certainly advising us of that and we being respectful of that. Mm. Thanks, David. Um, Lee, do you have any thoughts on that? No, I, I just reinforce what David said there. I think that's quite appropriate. Mm. Mm. Um, Okay, we've got another question, I think, which is um, quite interesting about, um, you know, how can, well, it, it's a question about how can we make our cities greener um, and in terms of a preference for the future character of our cities? Maybe I'll, I'll start with Lee. Okay. Um, well, I would just re, I would, um, reinforce what I've said about the importance of understanding the way in which, um, you know, even be before there were um, humans walking the land that we are now understanding as the landscapes that we share, there is um, uh, a sense of, of their identity being formed um, through those settings and those settings and the management of them, particularly through climate change, is a, a, a very vexed thing. Um, so our greening is, um, even if you'd asked me that question uh, 30 years ago, my view may well have, it, uh, hopefully it's, it's become a, a more sophisticated view, but I don't know that it means necessarily there's more vegetation. I think it's a lot more to do with how we actually understand the dynamics of change, including environmental change in our cities. Thanks, Lee. Um, David, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, look, I think um, probably two facets uh, to, to that um, in terms of greening and what we mean by that too. But certainly Geelong and Central Geelong was well known for a number of public spaces and it still is. And I just touched on Johnson Park today. But, um, you know, uh, back uh, over 100 years ago, uh, when Market Square was first to be developed, that, that itself was a green area. It had been, um, it became the Geelong Market and then it was re-greened again. Um, and, and then uh, quite controversially, um, the Premier of Victoria of the day said Geelong was over-lunged was the terminology, that we had too many parks. And obviously that was uh, for political reasons, for political expediency to allow market square to be built upon. So I think we need to, and we've had other controversial situations like that with some of our parks. So we probably need to value those we do have. We need to um, ensure that they are serving their purpose, um, and whether it be through uh, providing uh, fantastic vegetation and, and recreational opportunity um, and bringing back to our environment. But then we've got greening and greening our buildings. And so of course, heritage is part of that equation. The embodied energy in these buildings is really important uh, uh, energy saver to some degree, but they are high on energy consumption as well. And I think we have a great award-winning example of, of how you, you, you can achieve a really good outcome in the Bowen Water Development in, in Ryrie Street where we had a, a reasonably pedestrian, if that's the right way of saying it, brutalist design of the 1970s that's been revived um, using the, the, you know, the essential structure in a really new way um, to create a, a new vibrant building um, using, as I said, using that embodied energy to a large degree too. Okay. Um, we might finish with one, uh, we've got time I think for one more um, question. Um, and I, I, I'm going to reframe it around uh, something, David, that you mentioned um, previously. We've spoken a lot. And I think we talk when we talk about heritage, we we often talk about buildings, um, but um, it, it's more than just buildings. It's about the collection of buildings and about the the streets that hold those buildings together. Um, you know, those the importance of those public spaces. And you know, our streets have und undergone massive transformation. Um, as you mentioned, um, the streets, the, 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 the huddle grid wasn't designed for, um, for vehicular traffic, um, even though sometimes it feels as if the car has always been there. Um, 
what about that evolution of um, that you know historic urban landscapes that um, you know have changed so significantly over time? Um, do you think that we value those um, public spaces sufficiently, or is that you know could this be a new way to to, to look at the value um, of our public spaces, particularly our streets, and 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 reclaim that historic value? Oh, look, I think there's great opportunity there. The Geelong streetscapes have, have changed over time since since Geelong was first colonised, I suppose, um, whether it be through simple infrastructure, huge amounts of money um, were spent in the early days excavating um, Yarra Street, reclaiming the waterfront. That was all cliff faces. So there's been a lot of transformation of the natural environment to create what we started with um, in the 19th century. And then we've, we were able to exploit these fantastic wide streets with the um, introduction of the tram system we had in Geelong, which um, a number of um, uh, generations of Geelong people uh, look back to very fondly as a, a really good means of transportation into the city. Yes, there's been, you know, the introduction of palm trees in Geelong, in, in Moorable Street. I think we've got great opportunity um, for uh, readdressing um, these streets, whether it be um, kept, kept, uh, um, celebrating what Hoddle was trying to do and have these well ventilated streets, they could well be well landscaped ventilated streets and, and um, activated more for how we would like to live and use our cities, not just for cars. Mm. Lee? Okay. Uh, in reinforcing that, I think um, it's the natural world that we inhabit that in concert with our cities that provide our sense of scale and proportion. And, um, and in that sense, um, the cities within which we live are the cities that also grow within us. And um, I think that has an enormous value for the identity of cities because they're not subject to um, a, um, a consistent plan the world over or a consistent set of ideas the world over. They are very much located and in consequence, drawing out that locatedness, I think, will provide that sense of scale and proportion we feel comfortable with. And that's a challenge, I think, because that means each city has to do it themselves. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, uh, But I think that, that, that means that the cities are actually well lived in, but equally, they can be well loved. Thank you, Lee. Um... Thank you both um, for um, two wonderful talks and, and, and for the discussion. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get to everyone's questions today. Um, if you have any questions that are specific to projects that are underway in the city, um, please check out the Revitalising Central Geelong webpage for details. We'll put the, um, a link um, in the chat. Um, today, I think, you know, we, we're just really scratching the surface of um, two really important um, aspects of the character of our cities and the importance um, that they have in, in, in shaping our future. But I think it also shows, uh, really highlights the, um, the challenges that we have. Um, such a very contested um, area and continues to be um, so highly contested where we, we're trying to both protect that um, heritage and, and culture, but at the same time, um, allow our cities evolve in a, in a sustainable and, and resilient way. Um, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. We have a quick poll for you to complete about today's webinar. Um, it'll be in the chat. Um, you should just come up shortly. Um, we'd be really grateful if you could fill that in. And we hope to see you again um, next month at our next webinar, which is titled Place and Placemaking. And we'll be joined by Vanessa Walker and Dr. Emily Potter. Um, they're going to, to discuss the role of um, sense of place, sense of belonging, and, and how these concepts um, help shape um, spaces in our cities. So take care, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you all again next month. Thank you.